Russia is advancing in this war and nowhere has seen more movement than in the province of Donetsk. The progress Russia is making and the pressure that progress puts on Ukraine will be significant factors for any upcoming ceasefire negotiations. So this front is very crucial to understand, especially as we look at said negotiations. And that's exactly what we're going to do in today's video. Let's look at what Russia has been doing in Donetsk as well as in the neighboring provinces of Zaporizhia and Luhansk and what this all means for the war moving forward. We're going to look at where they've been making progress we're going to look at where they've been suffering losses and where they've been having supporting axes and why Ukraine is struggling so much here. First, let's look at Donetsk Oblast. In July of 2024, Russian forces intensified their offensive operations in Donetsk, particularly towards the cities of Kurakova and Pokrovsk. Ukrainian defenders faced significant pressure, with reports indicating that Russian troops were attempting to encircle Kurakova. Russian forces redeployed units to reinforce their offensive in this region as well. In August of 2024, the situation remained incredibly tense, with continued Russian assaults on Ukrainian positions. Ukrainian forces managed to hold key defensive lines, but the sustained pressure led to concerns about potential breakthroughs by Russian troops. In September, Russian forces made incremental gains in the region, capturing several villages and moving closer to key towns. Russian troops entered Sontivka village and were approaching Kurakova. Ukraine acknowledged intense fighting around Kurakova and Pokrovsk, emphasizing efforts to strengthen its own positions. In October, the strategic town of Vulodar, which was one of the cornerstone defensive towns along this defensive line, fell to Russian forces after two years of heavy resistance. This development marked a significant shift in control within the Donetsk region, particularly allowing Russian forces to launch further attacks deeper into Ukrainian territory and disrupt Ukraine's supply lines into the southern front. This led to an accelerated pace of Russian advances. And of course, by November, Russian forces continued their offensive operations, with reports indicating advances towards key urban areas like Pokrovsk. Russian troops continue to focus their efforts on Pokrovsk and Kurakova while attempting to encircle both. Ukraine faces significant challenges, particularly with manpower, where many units that are operating in this area are heavily outnumbered by a significant ratio to Russia, and they haven't received any rest since the war began. These are exhausted units that are facing extreme high rates of attrition, and they're faced with a complete annihilation if they're not able to successfully defend themselves. Looking to the north in Luhansk, in July, Russian forces conducted limited ground attacks south of Kremena. The fighting around Kremena has gone on for well over a year, with the landscape now looking like scenes from World War I. Russian troops attempted to push westward into eastern Kharkiv Oblast and northern Donetsk. Ukraine, however, managed to repel several of those attacks, maintaining their defensive positions. In August, Russia continued to accumulate manpower and equipment, indicating preparations for intensified offensive operations in Luhansk. However, there were no confirmed changes in the front line during this period. In September, Russian forces advanced west of Kremena amid continued offensive operations along the Kupiansk, Svatova, and Kremena line. We've talked about how important this defensive line is in my video about the Battle of Chasov Yar, which of course is continuing right now. Russian troops continue to focus their efforts on capturing the remainder of Luhansk while pushing westward into eastern Kharkiv and northern Donetsk. However, in October, no notable movements in the line took place, and of course that continued through November. In Zaporizhia, throughout the past several months, the front line has remained relatively stable. Some small-scale assaults have happened in the western and eastern sections of the front, however, this area has largely remained dormant. That is until November. Reports emerge that Russia may soon resume assaults in Zaporizhia, though those assaults may still remain small in scale and focused on the western end of the front. An article by a Ukrainian paper claimed that Ukraine's Kursk offensive redirected forces that were previously stationed in Zaporizhia and were preparing for a major offensive to Kursk. As a countermeasure, Ukraine had begun preparing defensive fortifications to defend against the new small-scale assaults. However, past assaults have been disorganized and repelled. All this is going on, of course, while Ukraine is defending from a Russian counteroffensive in Kursk. We talked about that in the last video. So if you want more information on that, check that video out. These two situations are closely related. What ha What is happening in Kursk is also impacting what's going on in Ukraine and vice versa. And both heavily impact the outlook for ceasefire negotiations looking forward. In that video about Kursk, whenever we talked about this, the units that were involved, we talked about units at the brigade level. Here, though, we're talking about units at the army level. It is a much larger, much more strategic picture. In the Donetsk direction, Russia is employing the 20th motor Rifle Division. They've been committed to this fight for months. The 20th may have rotated back into the fight sometime earlier this year, like around January or February, after having spent some time regenerating forces during the last winter. They have, however, reportedly suffered heavy losses over that time, but they do remain combat operational. The 3rd Guards Combined Arms Army is also operating in this area. The 2nd Army Corps of the LNR, which was an existing formation,
position up until about the midpoint of this year. That had been operating, but they got basically rolled into the 3rd Guards Combined Arms Army, so they're now a proper Russian formation. The 51st Combined Arms Army is also operating in this direction, and there's a similar story here. The 1st Army Corps of the DNR was also operating in this area, but just like the 2nd Army Corps of the LNR, the 1st Army Corps of the DNR also got rolled into the Russian Ministry of Defense, and they are also now a uniformed Russian formation. In the Luhansk direction, you have the 20th Combined Arms Army. This army is famous for firing a general after lining up troops for a ceremony, which was hit by a high Mars attack. That video was all over Twitter whenever it happened. It was a, it led to significant casualties. And this army has suffered significant losses throughout the fighting throughout this past couple years. One of the senior commanders for one of their downtrace units, the 144th Motor Rifle Division, had been arrested for other past failures. And that followed devastating losses during the Kiev Offensive, which was at the start of the war. This is basically the same force that had that catastrophe. Luhansk also has the 41st Combined Arms Army, as well as the 1st Guards Tank Army. The 1st GTA was the premier armored force within the Russian military prior to the war. They were basically designed to defend Moscow from a NATO attack and push NATO forces you know, out of Russia. However, at the start of the war, they attacked Kiev along with the 144th Motor Rifle Division. They were also completely decimated during that assault. They had since reconstituted, gone back into the fight, suffered yet more significant casualties, and then they had to get reconstituted again. So the first GTA, as of right now, is really a shell of its former self. However, that said, they're still engaged in the fight. In the Zaporizhia direction, the 5th Combined Arms Army, the 58th Combined Arms Army, the 49th Combined Army, and the 22nd Army Corps are also operational. However, they all appear to be remaining in a defensive posture, at least for right now. For Ukraine, the objective here is pretty simple. Hold on to as much ground as possible and inflict as many casualties on Russia as possible while defending this ground. Mud season has arrived, however, winter is fast approaching, and once the ground freezes, that might enable Russian forces to resume larger scale attacks, you know, throughout larger parts of the front line using more diverse types of equipment. That hasn't exactly stopped them from launching those types of attacks throughout the, the mud season. However, they've suffered significant attrition in that time, and that and the frozen ground might make it easier for them to move vehicles around. We've already talked in past videos about how right now Russia is losing significantly more troops day by day than they had at any other point in the war. It's pretty clear that Russia is attempting to seize as much ground as it can right now in anticipation of ceasefire negotiations. And so while they're trying to seize ground, they're really just pressing as many troops forward as they possibly can and therefore losing a lot of them. For Russia, the city of Pokrovsk is a very key objective. However, pushing Ukraine out of the administrative borders of Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kyrgyzstan are also on the table. They're more likely to attempt to push Ukraine out of the administrative borders of Donetsk and Luhansk before exactly worrying about Zaporizhia or Kyrgyzstan, since of course they haven't sustained any offensives in those other directions and they have more momentum going on in Donetsk and Luhansk. Pokrovsk is a key logistical node that has sustained Ukrainian forces all across the southeastern front line up to this point. However, now Pokrovsk is well within artillery range and that likely negates its logistics value. So Ukraine is in a position where it can settle in for yet another brutal, long, bloody battle for the city of Pokrovsk, just like Avdivka, like Bakhmut, like some of the cities that came before it. And Russia will have to deal with not only how long that will take, but how many casualties it will take to take the city of Pokrovsk. And with that, there's the open question of whether or not they're actually able to complete that seizure before the negotiations begin and what exactly that means for those negotiations. Russia is basically right now having to balance two different offensives. They're balancing the Kursk counteroffensive and they're balancing the Donetsk offensive. Obviously, we've already talked about Kursk. The Donetsk offensive has made increasingly higher rates of progress. However, they've also increased their rate of casualties day over day. Luhansk and Zaporizhia are, of course, supporting fronts in this effort. However, the amount of fighting, at least, that I've been able to tell from my from my vantage point does not at all match the amount of fighting that's going on in Donetsk right now, especially towards Kupiansk and Pokrovsk. However, that's not to say that there isn't fighting going on. Small-scale assaults continue to keep Ukrainian forces honest and present. However, they're not at all on the size and strength and, con and continuity that is going on in Donetsk. The key issue there is that with those assaults, Ukraine is forced to stretch their defensive lines, man the entire front, and they have limited personnel right now. And that limitation is really starting to strain Ukrainian defenders in this area. And that means a lot of trouble looking forward on if Ukraine can, can continue to hold. They did pass another round of mobilization. However, it's going to take time for those troops to be trained up and to be put in new formations. And it's going to be a question on whether those new formations are sent to stabilize areas of the front or if they're massed and used in a counterattack to basically 
repel parts of the Russian front line that have not yet been defended well, but have also been recently captured. Either way, Russia has a long way to go before they reach their ultimate objective of reaching Kiev and replacing the Zelensky government. However, that said, they are making some progress. But that is a topic for another day. For now, leave a like if you found this video helpful or informative. Comment your thoughts on what's going on with this offensive and where you think this fighting is going in the future and what you think this all means for negotiations looking forward. Subscribe if you want more videos just like this and I'll see you around next time. Later.